Creation is Al-Ard Wal-Samawat Wal-Jibal and they refused to accept it because they felt it's too heavy to carry. وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا And man accepted to carry that responsibility. The divine amana that was given to al-insan as a khalifa fil ard has lots of facets. Number one, he is a creature and he is responsible to save himself from himself and from all elements and all other creatures. So the primary amana is the amana of life itself. Without life, there is nothing. So this is the primary amana. The second amana is the amana to receive knowledge, guidance, and support from Allah and to be grateful for Allah for whatever He has provided for us. That's another type of amana, that the guidance is going to come from Allah and it is on us to receive it, understand it, and apply it in our life. That also serves the purpose of not only protecting our life here, but protecting a good life in the hereafter. So that also is another element of amana. A third element of amana is whatever we are entrusted with to take care of, to protect, to develop, or to do by others or for others. It is like parents are entrusted to take care of the kids. Husbands are entrusted to take care of certain responsibilities towards their wives and vice versa. The employee and the employer, the landlord and the resident in his house or his company. So those relationships are all amanat. In addition to this, we have an open amana to take care of each other. And that is kind of like spread throughout the Quran, talking about how to take care of our parents, our children, our wives, our neighbors, Muslims, non-Muslims. Almost it leaves no relationship without mention. So we are a trust and a gift for each other. Allah calls the children, for example, as a gift, hiba. He says, يَهَبُوا لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ inatha. He gifts to whom he wills, females. وَيَهَبُوا لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورِ And he gifts the males to whom he wills. So he's calling the children a gift. But we know, if you have children, you know that they are a gift, a trust, and a test. We know that. And that is true for every human being we come across. The beginning is humans are given into each other's hand and put in each other's way to become gifts. You get to know somebody, you have some benefits to get from this knowledge. And how do you turn this relationship into a test is up to you or up to the other side of the relationship. So the husband or the wife or both of them can turn each other from the gift they are supposed to be into the test they become. Likewise, any relationship is subject to this. So all of these spheres, if you will, and relationships fall under the principle of amana. Definitely, man has been prepared for this amana, as we explained uh, last time about what Allah SWT has given us of gifts, faculties, and ways and means to use and develop whatever Allah puts in our way 
in the land where we live. So when Allah invited Adam to enter into paradise and to dwell there with his wife, Udhul anta, uskun anta wa al jannah. Take residence, you and your wife, in paradise. That becomes also a sort of amana that you are not there to corrupt it, you are not there to live by your own rules, you are there to live by the rules of Allah, the one who created paradise. Likewise, when Adam is sent down to the earth, the earth is not made by Adam. It is made for Adam, but Adam is created to be entrusted with using that land, that earth, not as he wishes, but according to certain rules and parameters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets. You see, as we relate the concept of Khilafah and the concept of Amana and the situation of Adam from paradise down to the earth, as we are going to read and explain, you see that this is the context in which our life is given to us. This is the purpose for our life here to receive the amana from Allah and to take everything that we come across as a gift and a trust and to try not to turn anything or anyone as a test and a trial for us. And also the Quran teaches us something even beyond that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says teaching us dua Rabbana wala la taj'alna fitnatan lilladhina kafaru O Allah do not make us do not turn us into a test and a trial for those who disbelieve it's an amazing concept that we are asking Allah not to make us fitna a trial a tribulation for those who do not believe why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and sent us this message to follow on the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi who was sent as rahmah lil alameen. So with all of the concept of khilafah and the concept of amana and the concept of trust comes the concept of what is our primary mission towards the world in which we live? To become mercy to the world. Even the Prophet Sallallahu tells us, even when you slaughter an animal for food, be merciful, sharpen your knife. Do not keep passing the knife 10 times because it's torture. A sharp knife will cut the neck of the animal uh, in one time. So being rahmah is central because in practicing rahmah, we qualify ourselves for Allah's Rahmah. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamhum ar-Rahman. Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamkum man fil sama. Be merciful to those on earth so that Allah would be merciful to you. So these whole sets of ideas, if you will, constitute the context and the mission for which the earth was created, the heaven was created, the moon, the sun, all other things are made for us and we are made for Allah. So here you have it, ayah number 35. O Adam, dwell you and your wife in Al Jannah and eat from it abundance of everything wherever you go and do not come near that tree ولا تقرب هذه الشجرة the usage of the word هذه is to clarify for us that Allah pointed the specific tree for Adam so nobody should come and say Adam was confused or he didn't know what tree. Even when Iblis wanted to persuade him or whisper to him to eat, he also told him 
ما نهاكما ربكما عن هذه الشجرة so the tree is known to Adam from the beginning so that's not an excuse for his uh, sinful violation of the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the kingdom of heaven so what is his excuse the Quran says وَلَقَدْ عَاهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ آدَمَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَنَاسِيَا Adam forgot but the ayah doesn't say what did he forget it doesn't say but definitely the other ayat are telling us that he knew the tree from Allah in the beginning and Iblis himself pointed to the tree as he was persuading him to eat from it. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not mention what did Adam forget? Because it really doesn't matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand that we as Adam's children, we are inclined to forget. And that's why when he sends the Quran, he calls it a dhikr. And we are instructed to do a lot of dhikr all the time. Why? Because we are forgetful creatures. We are bound to forget. Why do we forget? Why didn't Allah make us with a solid memory that we never forget? Well, next time you have your creations, make them what you want. But this time, <laughs> the maker decides how to make what he makes, okay? But there is a wisdom behind it because we are rewarded for remembering, remembering Allah, remembering his orders, remembering his prohibitions, remembering our commitment, remembering the trusts we have to take care of, remembering our dependence, remembering our obligations. So if we have that solid memory that never forgets what would be our reward for so one of the reasons man is called insan is linguistically from the issue of nisyan forgetfulness and another way to look at the word insan also is because insan offers uns for each other. We are social creatures by definition. We love to be around other humans. And that's why one of the major punishments is uh, solitary confinement. It's considered torture by the UN Charter. It's considered torture. Why? Because when you isolate a human from the rest of his social network, you are diminishing his sensories, you are diminishing his sense of self because we tend to measure ourselves to each other. We tend to measure ourselves and even label ourselves and define ourselves by others. Let us say, for example, they tell you, Who are you? You say, I am the wife of, or the husband of, or I teach at that school, or I own that business. So we define ourselves and our function by each other and by the functions we perform. So if that context is taken away from us, we become like dead. We become like dead. So when Allah told Adam and his wife, do not come near that tree, فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ You end up being among the wrongdoers. It is also a hint for us not to come near anything prohibited. And this is a practice that we need to make a habit of. We need to make a habit that we do not ever venture into whatever is prohibited. You observe the limits of Allah 24-7, not just when you like it or when it pays off or when you label it as easy or pleasant or fun, as our youth always love to do what is fun and not do what is 
in the judgment boring or useless. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remember by exerting effort to remind ourselves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he sends us reminders all the time. Death is a reminder. Sickness and disease are reminders. Accidents that happen are reminders. Things that you know, blow back in our face are reminders. So Allah is always constantly sending us reminders, either in the form of blessings that we should accept as his gifts and be grateful for it, or as tests and trials so that we learn lessons as we move forward. And part of learning lesson is the tawbah. And we're coming to the ayah about Adam learning tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the context of our existence. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants our life to be a pleasant life in a social context that we benefit and benefit ourselves and benefit others. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, says, أحب الناس إلى الله أنفعهم للناس. The most beloved people to Allah are the ones who are beneficial and useful to others. And he doesn't say other Muslims or non Muslims, others. Other could include things and people. So you are a benefit to your land when you continue to cultivate it, grow it, tilt it, and take care of it. You are a benefit to the river from which you drink when you keep cleaning it. And you keep clearing it from any pollutants and anything else. So we, we need to regain focus that our life is not in vain. And the Quran makes this point very clearly. أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Do you think we have created you uselessly? For no purpose, no mission, no responsibility? And you are not coming back to us? And mind the word, تُرْجَعُونَ we don't go back by our own choice. Turja, maf'ul bih. You are maf'ul bih. From the beginning of your creation to the end of your life here. You are maf'ul bih. When do you become a subject? When you use your free will to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or else, God forbid, to worship yourself or please anyone else. These are the two choices that we live to be tested. Which one will we choose? So ayah number 36. فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا أَزَلَّ We are used to use it in the Arabic language. زَلَّةُ القدم. When your foot slips. And what happens? When a person's foot slips, he falls. Right? So what did the shaitan do? The shaitan caused Adam, using Adam's desire for eternal life and for staying in paradise because he loves it. It's lovely. It's very beautiful. And the fact that our father Adam really slipped because of his love of paradise and seeing how close he is to angels, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. That is not a bad thing. The bad thing is that he did not remember that Allah has told him, steer away from that tree. Do not come near. And we explained before that he told him, do not come near, because it is too attractive to resist, too tempting to avoid. So once you get close, you will slip. How did he do it? He gave them the push. And in Surah Al-A'raf, it tells us how Adam did it. Adam, let me go there 
so that let me go there because it's nice to have the text so so the same text uh, ayah number 19 in al-araf it says exactly the same one like ayah number 35 the word that's not here only ragada but fakula min haythu shi'tuma wa la taqraba hadhi ash-shajara fatakuna min al-dhalimin the warning is exactly the same here it doesn't say fa'azal lahuma it gives us how did adam uh, how did iblis make them slip it gives us the detail of what iblis did to adam and فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ He started talking to them, filling their ears. And the ears and the eyes are windows to the heart. They both look for what the heart is interested in, and they make the heart interested in what you hear and what you see, or it turns it off. So when you see something beautiful or hear some sound that is nice and effective and beautiful, you're attracted, you want to listen. When you hear something awful, you want to turn your ears off, right? So, فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ Does the shaitan talk to our ears or talk to our heart or talk to our soul or talk to our feelings? What does he actually you will get to see this here. What is the purpose? There is a, a letter mentioned here that is misunderstood. And the letter is Alam fi qawli ta'ala liyubdiya lahuma liyubdiya lahuma Hadihi alam ismuha alam al-aqiba It is like the consequential lamb. It is like فَالْتَقَطَهُ آلُ فِرْعَوْنَ لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ عَدُوًّا وَحَزَنًا لَامُ الْعَاقِبَةِ تَتَحَدَّثْ عَمَّا يَأُولْ إِلَيْهِ الْأَمْرِ لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ عَدُوًّا وَحَزَنًا So here it doesn't say that he did this so that he would show them their awrah but it says he did the wiswas and the wiswas led them to uncover their aura, led their aura to be exposed. That means that Adam and Eve are created with sawah, right? Here the word is sawat, not sawah wahid, right? Physical sawah, or sawatan, right? Al-qubul wa dubur But if you talk about human flaws, we are full of them. We are full of shortcomings. And you know this from the Quran. This is not somebody's inferences or conclusions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودٍ وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٍ وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ All of this counting the flaws that we are in constant denial of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we love wealth and money and possessiveness and control and this life's toys. We are so immersed in this life. These are flaws. These are sawat. And physically speaking, nothing comes from inside of this body that smells good or feels good. That's why we can constantly clean ourselves, and we must, because nothing comes out of us that is pure, except for 
the Prophet ﷺ saying that su'urul muslimi shifa' that your saliva is supposed to be clean because you are doing dhikrillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are one of those creatures whose tongue is more frequently remembering Allah and that makes your su'ur, your saliva uh, pure and, and clean. So if you spit, for example, on your clothes, you don't need to repeat your wudu. You can clean it like cleaning dust, but dust or your saliva do not nullify your wudu. But definitely urine does, right? If it comes out, your wudu is gone. Wind coming from the other side also would nullify the person's wudu. So wind, rih. Ah, إذا أخرج الإنسان ريحا انتقض وضوءه. نعم. So because we are full of physical flaws inside us, we need constant physical cleansing. But we have moral and psychological flaws that also requires cleansing, and that's why Allah سبحانه وتعالى clears that issue for us in Surah Al-Shams وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا So the flaws of the nafs also require constant purification constant cleansing I have to always hold myself responsible and accountable and hold it to the cleansing. Let the Quran cleanse your tongue, cleanse your eye, cleanse your ear, cleanse your heart, so that your soul is more likely to be muzakka than mudassa. Mudassa means indulged. Okay? Yes, yes. The Qur'an is meant for us to cleanse ourselves, to cleanse our hearts, our souls, our bodies, everything. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهَرِينَ التَّوْبَةِ طَهَارَةٌ لِلنَّفْسِ وَالطَّهَارَةٌ طَهَارَةٌ لِلْبَدَنِ تَنْقِيَ لِلْبَدَنِ Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combined the two. That through our tawbah, through our observation of the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we keep our souls clean, we keep our hearts pure, we keep our intentions in check, so that we live a righteous life. Let's continue how Iblis tempted Adam. So what does he say? He say, here is Adam, uh, Iblis, developing a plan and his plan is to tell them his own interpretation for Allah's plan and trying to persuade Adam for his own mizaj and hawa and for what he likes to violate Allah's rule. So here's what he says. ما نهاكما ربكما Your Lord never prohibited you from that tree عن هذه الشجرة إلا أن تكونا ملكين except that if you eat from that tree you will turn into two angels إلا أن تكونا ملكين أو تكون من الخالدين or else you become among those who live for eternity which means you will stay in paradise forever so what is in this persuasion in this persuasion Iblis is basing his argument with Adam or his persuasion with Adam on a false premise. What is the false premise? The false premise is he is telling Adam 
Allah didn't want you to become angels. So he told you, don't eat from that tree. That's false. Allah didn't say that. Allah told Adam, فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ If you come near that tree, you will fall and you will be among the wrongdoers. You will wrong yourself. You will commit injustice against yourself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, did not create Adam basically to live for eternity in paradise from the day he enters until the day of judgment. Where is the test? Where is the test? So, so Iblis uses, and I want you to follow this, it's a false assumption, followed by false argument. What's the false argument? The false argument is, if you eat from that tree, you will become two angels. Did they really become two angels? No, they did not, right? So he falsely made a false promise in the form of a good argument, but it is a false argument because it's based on a false promise. So Allah, who created Adam with his own hands, is advising Adam to stay away from that tree, to protect him from wronging himself. Here is Iblis wanting Adam to accept him as a Nasih Amin, a trusted advisor. And he is putting himself as a trusting, trusted advisor for Adam against the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see how far false and how far wicked the shaitan is. This is all part of Allah's plan. Yes. Iblis is meant to be a wicked creature from the beginning. From the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Adam, فَلَا يُخْرِجَنَّكُمَا مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ فَتَشْقَى Let him not get you out of paradise, lest you would suffer. Iblis is telling Adam, you are here to stay for good if you eat from that tree. The opposite of what Allah is saying. And that clarity of how Iblis tempts Adam is mentioned to us in the story of Iblis and Adam so that we never believe Iblis and his temptation. But unfortunately, like Adam forgot, we also are too distracted to remember Allah 24-7. So the minutes you forget Allah, the minutes you expose yourself to the temptation of shaitan that can doom not only your life here, but your life in the hereafter. So this is serious. This is the most serious challenge that humans face. Parallel to it is the challenge of desires and succumbing to evil feelings and evil desires. I was going to ask you the same question. Like, how would you, because you got two issues here, you got Iblis and you got forgetting. How would you distinguish, what does this mean for us as a human? How would you distinguish your feeling of forgetting things from Iblis telling you things? So? First of all, this is a good question. How do you distinguish between your feelings that come from you and the wiswas that comes from the shaitan? Treat them the same unless otherwise is proven. An nafs al ammara bisu mithluha mithlu iblis. The nafs that commands you to do evil, to think evil, to behave evil and to think wicked and to behave wickedly, this nafs is the same like the shaitan. And that's under why... Under the control of shaitan. Huh? Is under the control of shaitan. 
what is under the control of the shaitan. No, it is. Uh, that is true, but that's not to succumb to. I know. Because Allah has given us our nafs and created us as free agents on our own behalf. So if we say the shaitan controls our nafs, that means we are not responsible. No, no, you cannot control our nafs. No. We must Unless control. We agree with him. No, we must control ourselves. Okay. Dr. I, Noor. I agree. Okay. We open to the shaitan. Huh? We go against the shaitan. Yes. So, How do we know if the ideas running in my head are from the shaitan or from my evil soul? Uh. Well, if the idea itself is evil, it doesn't matter. I should push back, that's it. If the idea is evil, then I am legitimately considering it. Is it from the shaitan or from my evil self? It really doesn't matter. What matters is, I should push back. How would you know it's evil? Huh? How would you know it's evil? How do I know that's evil? Yeah. If the idea leads me to think something good, or do something good, or say something good, it is from Allah and from the good side of my soul. Okay? If it is the other way around, it is from my wicked side of my soul or from the shaitan. Okay. Does this answer your question? Okay. So, وَقَالَ مَا نَهَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمَا عَنْ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَ Again pointing to the tree. إِلَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ مَلَكَيْنَ أَوْ تَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ Why are we going in details explaining how the shaitan does temptation and with was, you know, whispering and mind game, mind control. The shaitan used things that Adam loves. Right? Adam loves paradise because life in paradise is very pleasant. How does the shaitan know? This is the access that Allah has given him. We explained that before. That the shaitan knows about us things we do not know about him. How does he know? By observing us. And we mentioned the example of watching a silent movie. You know what the actors are doing, what is this person's intention, what is his plan, what he wants to do. Is he afraid? Is he worried? Is he hopeful? Does he love her? Does she want him? We figure this from how people behave even in a silent movie. So without talking, the shaitan is observing us. And he is observing us from all sides. As we'll get to know in Surah Al-A'raf. Okay? Besides the false logic that the shaitan uses to tempt Adam, he goes on and he is so daring that he swore, وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ He swore to them, I am a very good, sincere advisor to you. الراجل يعني بينصحهم لوجه الله يعني السلام عليكم السلام so the shaitan wants Adam and Eve to believe him because he knows that Allah has warned them إن هذا عدو لك ولزوجك and maybe this is the issue that Adam forgot 
when Iblis kept talking to him and he swore to him, he said, my enemy would not want me to live forever. My enemy would not want me to live in this nice place. But this guy is telling me, if I eat from that tree, it's so persuasive. So Adam, in the zeal and the, the indifa, the, the tense inclination to stay in paradise, he wanted to believe Iblis. So Iblis became believable because Adam wanted Iblis to be believable. Because if he's believable, Adam will live for eternity, or else he will turn into an angel. So what is wrong with either one? Nothing wrong. I benefit both ways. Why are we going into those details? Because they are important. Iblis uses certain things, things that we like, things that we fear, things that we hate, things that we worry about, people we love, people we hate. He uses our hopes, he uses our concerns, right? To give us answers, novice answers, so that you cannot imagine what Iblis is telling you. And you think, yeah. I want to give you one example that's given uh, to us in the Quran. When the, uh, in the story of Yusuf and his brothers, when they conspired to kill Yusuf, what did they say? They say, Uqtulu Yusufa. أو اطرحوه أرضا يخلو لكم وجه أبيكم وتكونوا من بعده قوما صالحين Kill Yusuf or throw him off the top of the mountain so that your dad will have nothing to love about Yusuf and he will be all yours يخلو لكم وجه أبيكم and then the promise is وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ Then you can repent and you can fix that and you will be righteous. If this is not devilish, what is? So I'm trying to reach a point that everyone listening is convinced that every temptation of the devil starts with, or the wicked soul, it starts with false assumptions, followed by false reasoning, leading to false conclusions that are made very beautiful. And this is not me saying it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ He made their evil deeds seem beautiful and pleasant and useful in their eyes. You can exam, yeah. exempt yourself? From the waswasa of shaitan. The waswasa is going to continue until you take your last breath. Yeah, yeah. But, you can, you but the Quran told us how to deal with it. If you make tawbah, halal shaitan. Tawbah is after the sin. He is asking, how do I protect myself from waswasa, right? Okay. The protection is Because when I remember Allah, I'm not likely to be easily tempted, whether by the shaitan or by own desires. How? Again, in Surah Al-A'raf, in the latter part of Surah Al-A'raf, you will find the ayat that talks about the shaitan is engaged in discovery and identifying our vulnerability, kind of like 360 angles. <laughs> okay? He says, ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ Mind you, 
He did not say وَمِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ Allah barred him from being between you and Allah. So your only exit from that siege of the shaitan is that connection with Allah. If that connection is cut or obscured or weakened, then that sanction regime of the shaitan revolving around you, trying to identify your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses, your hopes, your fears, what you like, what you hate, what you want, what you don't want. Because why is he revolving around us? It is to understand every one of us. So before he tempts you, he knows about you things that you may not recognize about yourself. But every one of us has got to know about himself. Because the Quran said so. The Quran says, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَاذِيرًا Man knows well himself, no matter how many excuses he presents. I know what I like. I know what I don't like. I know what I want. I know what I don't want. And I should also know that those are the vulnerabilities that the shaitan uses and my wicked side of myself gravitates towards. Let's take an example, practical example. We know that the Prophet ﷺ says, ما تركت على أمتي فتنة أكثر من فتنة النساء. The Quran tells us, let me translate the hadith first. I have not left a trial for men of my ummah as strong as the trial of women. Because they are attractive, right? They are tempting. They are? Attractive and tempting. Ma'ul, uh -huh. you don't know that? Huh? Attractive, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so when Allah then tells us, do not extend a second look beyond the inadvertent, unintended look. The first look is okay. Is that true? The first look is forgiven but provided that it is a snapshot not a video <laughs> but if you want to take a video that's not the first look <laughs> so so we know then that my eye can cause me to start interacting with what I see. So Allah is telling me your protection that your eye, which is the messenger to your heart, does not take pictures that stay in your heart afterwards. Don't look the second look. The first shot, turn away. That's it. So this is how you have control over your vulnerabilities so that the shaitan does not have a chance to use them. You understand? Okay. So Iblis added to his persuasion and logic, false logic and false reasoning, his swearing, وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ Where did Adam fall? He believed this one. Because if he had not believed it, he wouldn't have acted on Iblis' advice. Right? If Adam did not believe Iblis' advice, Adam would not have followed Iblis. 
if Adam did not believe that Iblis is really a sincere advisor, if he remembered that he is the enemy Allah told him he is, Adam would not have even listened to him from the beginning. But Adam forgot that Allah told him, this is your enemy, don't let him get you out of paradise lest you suffer. So what happened when he swore, فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورٍ Do you know dalla and the dal and the dalla, right? Dalla from dalla yadullu wa dalla bil alif al maqsura from adla which means to for example if i lower this to dr noor right i'm bringing it closer to him i want him to take note of it and to take it this is dalla which means to bring something close, right? فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورٍ By his deception, he made it very easy for them to want to get even closer to the tree and to try it out. فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورٍ In his deception. So the shaitan never tells us the truth. And this is a fact we theoretically know, but we need to practice that fact. It is like the fact that the shaitan is our enemy. We need to practice that fact. Okay? So the ayah I was referring to in, in Surah uh, Al-A'raf, that the shaitan will come from in front of us, behind us, on our rights, on our lefts, so that we are no longer grateful وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ Do you know why? Because the shaitan keeps us focused on what we do not have. Right? So, the lady you see other than your wife is more attractive than your wife. The money you don't have is more attractive than the money you already have. So the shaitan has a way to make us believe him. And Allah is trying to tell us, don't believe him. He is your enemy, enemy. Can any wise person take advice from his enemies? Does the US take advice from Russia? <laughs> no. Huh? No, no, no. Sometimes. Huh? Sometimes they do? They take lessons from the Russian experience, sometimes. <laughs> but they don't listen to them, yes. So, Shaitan is invisible to us. Yes. Was he invisible to uh, Adam during this whole thing? Was Adam made a human? Was he like, was he in the scene? Was, was Adam a human? <laughs> you don't know? No, no, it's not. Adam was not a human? No, I mean, I'm talking about Iblis. No, I'm talking about, was Adam a human? Then it applies to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya bani Adam, la yaftinnakum shaytanu kama akhraj abawaykum min al-jannah. Huh? Wa'adhin? إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ So they were having this, this conversation without seeing each other? Yes. No, no, the shaitan sees Adam. Adam doesn't see the shaitan. But they were having the shaitan can appear. Yeah, they, it, is like, it is like Allah had a conversation with Musa. Did Musa see Allah? He had a conversation with Ibrahim. Did Ibrahim see Allah? Does the shaitan have a conversation with you? He has a conversation with me every day. If there's anyone who doesn't have a conversation with the shaitan, he's not a human. 
he's talking to us. What is the Wiswas? Wiswas is private, secret talk between someone and someone else. The shaitan can make Wiswas. A human being can make Wiswas also, right? So you listen to Shaitin al Ins but not Shaitin al Jinn? We listen to all of them. If we don't listen, if we are deaf to them, they cannot influence us. You understand? Okay. So, فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورٍ فَلَمَّا ذَاقَ الشَّجَرَةَ بَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوْآتُهُمَا وَطَفِقَ يَخْصِفَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا مِنْ وَرَقِ الْجَنَّةِ So the physical sawa of Adam and Eve was exposed and they started to pick tree leaves from Warak al-Jannah, from the leaves of the trees in paradise, to cover themselves, to cover their aura. Listen to this. It is in the same ayah, ayah number 22, Al-Araf. It says, وَنَادَى هُمَا رَبُّهُمَا And Allah called them both. Right? وَنَادَى هُمَا رَبُّهُمَا أَلَمْ أَنْهَكُمَا عَنْ تِلْكُمَا الشَّجَرَةِ Here he does not say هذه الشجرة because they ate and they left. Right? Because they left to bring tree leaves to cover themselves. Right? So Allah is asking them haven't I prohibited you from eating from that tree and from getting even close to it. وَأَقُلْ لَكُمَا Didn't I tell you إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمَا عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Haven't I told you that the shaitan is a clear enemy to you? And the word mubin is to take away anybody's excuse that I don't see him. You don't have to see an enemy, right? Do you see the wind? Do you see the wind? You don't, right? But you see its effect, right? So Allah tells us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا Those who have taqwa, those who live a life in which they are mindful and sensitive to the presence of Allah in their life, right? إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ The shaitan is circulating around you, right? When you, when, when the shaitan starts to do that, you get a feeling if you have taqwa. You get a feeling that the, this is shaitan and what he's doing is he is looking at your vulnerabilities to persuade you with false assumption, false logic, false reasoning to reach a false conclusion like his. Okay? So this is the way the Quran explains how to push back against the temptation of the shaitan. First, to recognize his presence by recognizing what he throws into your ears or what he makes beautiful in your eyes. So not everything that you see that looks beautiful is to be taken as beautiful. And not everything that you see that seems scary should be perceived as scary or treated as scary, okay? We should see things through one prism and one prism only. Is it in my interest or is it against my interest? Not is it lovely in my eyes, not is it pleasant in my heart, not does it make me feel good about myself? Those are the wrong questions, okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reminding Adam and Eve of what he had told them. لا تقرب هذه الشجرة Don't come near that tree. And this is your enemy. Take him for the enemy it is. We'll stop here. And inshallah, we'll see you next week. Subhanak Allahumma hamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.